Hi guys, this is the ASMR Nerd, and today we are continuing our soft-spoken reading of Martin the Warrior by Brian Jakes. We are on chapter four now, and we're just going to pick up right where we left off. The ship Sea Scarab rode at anchor in the bay as four longboats were beached above the tide line. The pirates had come ashore. Surrounded by his savage ragtag crew, Captain Tromon Clog strode into Fortress Marshank. Badrang had the way lined with heavily armed soldiers. They gripped spears tightly, scowling at the ill assorted mob from the Sea Scarab. With a great clatter of clogs, Traman hauled out his cutlass and roared playfully as he made a mock dash at Badrang's soldiers. They drew back in alarm, and Clog winked roguishly at them. Ha <laughs> ha, caught your napping there, mateys. You've all gone soft playing at being landlubbers. Ho there, frog bit, nip board, and you, flea bane. Been a bit of water passed under the keel since we sailed together. You're looking plump and prosperous these days. Swaggering up to the tyrant's wooden long hut, Clog booted the door. Anyone home to receive a poor sea dog who's down on his luck? The weasel captain, Hisk, swung the door open and announced in a dignified manner, Enter, captain. My master awaits your pleasure. Oh, do we now? Well, ain't that pretty? A sea rat called Oilback sniggered at Hisk. Badrang knew he was playing a dangerous game, but slyness and treachery had always been the order of the day between himself and Clog. The idea was for neither stoat to show he was afraid of the other and to keep up a pretense of being old friends. With this in mind, Badrang rushed at his former partner, hugging him tightly as he dropped into Corsair slang. Well, well, burn me bilges if I ain't Captain Truman Clog. How are you, you old wave dog? Truman pounded the other's back, grinning widely. Badrang, me messmate. Strike me, but you're looking fit as a fish and spry as a wasp. Oh, it's just good for me old eyes to see you again, me arty. Look what I've brought for you. At a signal from Clog, two sea rats upended a cask upon the table. They smashed in the head and scooped out two beakers, which they presented to the stoats. Badrang brought the drink swiftly to his mouth, halting slyly as Clog took a great gulp of his. It flowed down through the pirate stoat's chin plates as he swigged noisily. Dams and wine, matey, the best on earth, and all for me and you. Badrang took a drink that was more of a sip than a gulp. Prime stuff. You always knew a good barrel of drink, you rascal. Clog released Badrang and slumped down in the tyrant's throne chair, resting his clogged footpaws noisily on the tabletop. Just like old days, eh? Badrang seated himself on the edge of the table, smiling. Aye, just like in the old days, mate. How long is this since we were last together, do you reckon? Clog took another swig, grinning and winking. Badrang took a sip, pursing his lips. Too long, I'd say, Truman. It's good to see you again. They continued to play the game, this time with Clog's paw straying close to his cutlass, whilst Badrang toyed with the bone handle of a long skinning dagger. I recall last when, <clears throat> when we was last together, you left me stranded on a reef while you sailed off with two score slaves, half of which was mine by rights. Now the pirate's voice began to carry a menacing undertone. Badrang's face was the picture of injured innocence. Me sailed off and left you. More the other way around, as I recall. There was a mighty storm, and we were blown off course. My vessel was wrecked, and the slaves lost, all of them. When you never turned up to help me, I trekked off overland and ended up in this place. In a trice, the time for merriment and reminiscence was over. 
Plog hurled his beaker at the wall and stood up. Aye, and look at you now, Lord Badrang, if you please, surrounded by a fine fortress and a passel of slaves. I'll wager. Well, I want what's due to me. I've come for my chair. Badrang leapt up, confronting his enemy eye to eye. I worked too hard to get what I've made here, Clog. Your share's nothing, and that's what you'll get. Did you hear that, lads? The pirate stoat drew his blade. Let's show this black-hearted swab that we ain't here to beg. We've come to take a full complement of slaves to row the sea scarab from all three decks. With a wild roar, Clog's crew unsheathed their weapons and stood ready for slaughter. Make a move and your captain's a dead un. The tyrant made his move like lightning. Kicking aside Clog's blade, he grabbed the stoat's plated beard. A dagger appeared in his other paw, dangerously close to Traman's throat. This blade is poisoned. One nick is all it takes. Hisk! The archers have surrounded these quarters, lord, the weasel captain called from the doorway. They're standing ready with poison shafts. None of this scum will leave alive. Clog held up a paw to his crew. Oh, wait. Uh, hold your rush, lads. Put those carvers up. He was still smiling, but Badrang could sense the animal rage behind Clog's grinning features as the pirate addressed him. You win, matey. Though I never thought you'd use a dirty trick like a poison like poison weapons against an old shipmate. Put up your blade. I'll go peaceful like back to me ship. Badrang stood at the main gates until every last corsair was out of his fortress. The tyrant was satisfied he had outwitted his foe without bloodshed, which would have been considerable on both sides if a fight had broken out inside Marshank. The archers had their shafts trained on Clog as he jabbed a warning paw at his enemy. Ah, that's twice you crossed me, Badrang, but the third time I'll win. I'm gone. You, but you can take your oath I'll be back, so don't rest easy, matey. One dark night I'll slip in when you're least expecting it. Then I'll slit your gullet, take the slaves, and burn this fancy place down round your dead ears. That's a promise. Owing to the heightened tension and upset of the pirates' visit, it was not until late night that the prisoners were fed. Armed with a bowl of kitchen scraps and accompanied by Gurid, a young male otter named Keela stood dropping the leftovers through the grating to the prisoners below. Gurid drew his cloak close against a chill breeze from the sea. He wanted to be back by the fire, eating roasted fish and drinking the damson wine that Clog had left. The rat shoved Keela sharply. Come on, you. Stir your stumps. It's cold out here. Keela shrugged as he sat on the grating, poking scraps between the bars one bit at a time. Cold, sir. I think it's quite warm out here. Still, you do look a bit drawn and peakish. Maybe you're coming down with fever. Fever? I got no fever, the rat shuddered and sniffed. Gurid was quite taken aback when the young otter stood up and tucked the cloak more snugly around him. You never know, sir. Those sea rats bring all kinds of illness ashore with them. Why don't you take yourself indoors by the fire and have a nice beaker of wine? I'll see to these idiots. <laughs> only make, they're only making things harder for us other slaves, behaving the way they do. Dim-witted fools. You run along now, sir. I'll take care of feeding these three. Gurid hesitated a moment, and then shivered as a fresh wind blew round him. That seemed to settle the issue. Listen, I I'm getting inside where I'll be warmer. Don't be too long out here, and report straight back to the compound guard when you're finished, you hear? Keela threw the rat a smart salute. Don't you worry, sir. I need my sleep. I won't be long. Better hurry now. Your eyes look a bit cloudy to me. Gurid needed no further urging. He scurried off, shivering and rubbing his eyes, convinced he was sickening for fever. Giggling quietly to himself, the otter pressed his face to the grating and called down, Feldo, are you all right? The squirrel stood upon Martin's shoulders and drew himself up so that he was close to the bars. Keela, my friend, listen carefully. Here's what I want you to do. Rose and Grum stood on the tide line, 
watching the silvery wake of sea scarab as the craft headed out, veering on a southerly tack into the open sea. You're Miss Rose, or you suppose Evelyan's wanted. Rose tossed a pebble into the shallows. I've no idea, Grum, but whatever it was, they didn't seem too happy leaving here. The two companions walked back to the fortress walls, to the spot beneath the main gates, where Rose had conversed with Martin. The mouse maid looked up at the twin posts with rope ends blowing loosely, uh, loosely from it, in the night wind. Oh, I hope Martin's all right. Trust Badrang to think up something cruel like that, binding a poor creature up there in the middle of a storm. Grum held up a paw for silence. Shush now, Roser. Do you hear that? Some beasts are singing. Keela had a fine deep voice that carried well. Rose and Grum listened to his song as it drifted over the walls to them. I know a mouse called Martin and a young un whose name Brome, captured by some vermin scouts as he strayed from his home. So if you're out there listening, I'll pause a while and wait, for I've been singing half the night on this side of the gate. Rose almost wept for joy. She was answering in an instant, being both a good singer and a balladeer. Grum grunted softly as she hugged him tight with happiness, her clear voice ringing out plaintively on the night breeze. My name is no Rose of Noonvale, the tribe of Urinval. My only brother is called Brome, and Martin's name I know. We're here so we can help them, so please, friend, tell to me what we can do to aid these two and try to set them free. Immediately, a hurried few lines rang out clear in reply. A vermin guard approaches. Quick, get yourselves from sight. I'll try to get back to you this time tomorrow night. Heeding the warning, Rose and Grum withdrew swiftly to the rocky outcrop where they had hidden earlier that day. Fleabane and Rotnose the Weasels came striding forward and grabbed Keela roughly. Eh, hey, what's all that singing for, Otter? You ain't got nothing to sing about. Yeah, slaves don't sing. What are you singing about? Well, you see, Gurud thought he had fever, Keela explained. So he went inside and left me to feed the prisoners. When I finished giving them their food, I thought I'd better sing an old Otter charm to keep the fortress free from sickness. Singing charms, what a load of old nonsense, Fleabane sneered. Rotnose was superstitious and terrified of sickness. No, it ain't. Come on, Otter, let's hear you sing it. Keela obliged, making up the words as he went along. O oh, spirit of the seasons, uh, who rules the land and sea, uh, from crabby claws and runny snouts, good spirit, keep us free. Uh, from tummy ache, sore tail and sniffs, from grunge and uh, whisker cramp, uh, from wobbly paws and flurgy twinge, oh, uh, keep all in this camp. Ha! Grunge and wobbly paws, rubbish! Fleabane scoffed aloud, and who's ever heard of flurgy twinge? Keela looked aghast at the weasel. You don't know what flurgy twinge is? No, and I don't care. Keela leaned close to the two guards, whispering confidentially. I knew a fine, big, strong hedgehog long ago. He laughed at Flurgy Twinge. Poor creature, he never laughed again. The young otter looked so serious that the weasels were taken aback. Uh, take no notice of Fleabane, youngin. Uh, he's a fool. Rotnose apologized in hushed tones. Uh, you carry me, uh, you carry on singing your charms and, and, I'll, and sing an extra one for me. The two guards carried on their patrol, arguing amongst themselves. Wobbly paws and grunge, I still don't believe it. Listen, you don't scuffle what you don't know about. Look at that mark on your ear. That could be the start of grunge. Where? What mark? There, that sort of yellow mark on your left ear. Can't you see it? Loaf brain, how can I see me own ear? Er, does it look serious? Well, it wasn't at the start of the season. I think we'd best learn the words of that charm. Uh, how does it go? 
Uh, from flirty paws and, and grungy tummy, the uh, spirit keep us free. Wobbly whiskers, uh, da de da. Daddy die yourself, Boulder Bottom. Or, <laughs> Daddy die yourself, Boulder Bottom. They're not the right words. Keela laughed aloud as he made his way back to the compound. And that's the end of chapter four. Next time, we'll read chapter five. But uh, for now, put the bookmark back in and close up Martin the Warrior for another night. Um, this was actually kind of a challenging chapter. I uh, hadn't really thought about how I was going to deal with songs, and uh, I just kind of made up little tunes along the way. And I guess that's what I'll be doing. Uh, from here on out, I don't know, we'll see, but, uh, Brian Jakes definitely does like to have his songs in his Redwall books now and again, so that's definitely going to be something that's recurring, and I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope it wasn't too cringe-inducing, uh, for you, but, uh, I do what I can. Anyhow, um, as I always say at the end of these videos, if, uh, you like what you're hearing here, I really encourage you to uh, go buy the book um, and all the rest of the Red Wall books, all uh, 23 of them, if it's something that you're really keen on. Um, they are just such great, um, you know, wholesome adventures, I guess. It's a good way of putting it. They're uh, a lot of fun. And uh, there's also a really great audiobook uh, adaptation of Martin the Warrior and many of the other Redwall books. Uh, they're narrated by uh, none other than uh, the author Brian Jakes uh, and voiced by a really talented cast uh, that includes uh, Brian Jakes' son, uh, who is Martin the Warrior in the audiobook. Uh, and I think you can get that on audible.com, probably other places too, but uh, well worth checking out. Anyway, uh, Thank you very much for listening, uh, and as always, I uh, look forward to seeing you back here next time.